Well, um, gosh, great turnout tonight. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Beth Schmidt, and I currently work at Markel, just <coughs> catty corner from here. Um, a lot of people call it Markel, and I tell them it's like Superman is Cal L. It's Mark L. So <laughs> anyway, I've um, been there just under a year, uh, but I, I have, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or so years in software development um, at various different companies. Have been involved in Agile for um, a very long time as well. I don't know. I, I lose track of time. 16 years or something like that. It's, it's been a while. So um, I wanted to kind of share um, some things that I've experienced in my journey across these other companies. And uh, hopefully there'll be some good information for you that you can take back. So now if I can remember how I did that. Um, the first thing I want to ask, though, is how many of you work in a company that uses traditional or waterfall practices? Nobody? All of you are using some form of agile? Is that great? Good, I think. Unless you're just really shy and don't want to admit it. So <laughs> that could be too. Well, I just kind of wanted to um, you know, go over a couple of the basics just to sort of set the stage, not knowing for sure what sort of a mix I would have in the audience. But um, most of you are probably already familiar with the fact that the waterfall approach, which was done for for many, many years, you know, you do all the requirements gathering up front, and then after that's done, it's sort of signed off and handed over to the design team and then the development team after that's done, and finally it goes over the wall for testing, <coughs> and then finally deployment. At the end of all of that, um, you get one big deliverable. And um, sometimes, you know, that, that process can take a very, very long time. I was involved in a project one time that I think the requirements phase alone took 18 months. Um, I'm not sure the rest of the project took that long. It just took a long time to get the requirements. But um, by the time you deliver the product, it may or may not still fit the business need. So that's one of the concerns with that approach. So whereas, whoo, this thing's got to get used to it, touchy. Um, with Agile, uh, you know, the work is broken down into smaller increments. You know, a backlog is created of the work, and um, teams iterate through that. They pull in small amounts and do um, sprints or... Um, you know, one to four week long um, sprints or iterations. Sorry, that's the word I was looking for. And, um, you know, deliver something uh, potentially shippable at the end of that time period. And then they go through another increment and they keep building on that until they have the final product uh, completed. So there's a lot of um, feedback and input into the process along the way to ensure that what you're delivering is, in fact, what your customers would like. So um, the other point I want to make is that. Um, um, a lot of people, myself included, tend to use the word agile when we're really talking about Scrum. And so just kind of a reminder that agile sort of a, well, agile is a mindset, but there are a lot of things that fit under the umbrella, a lot of different techniques. And um, so Scrum is one of the many uh, frameworks under agile. So that's the level setting portion of the presentation, I think. So, <laughs> um, and also, I guess, why do companies make the decision to move to um, agile practices instead of the waterfall approach? Um, in 2015, and I think it, it had been uh, published prior years as well, a Chaos Manifesto um, reported these types of results for projects that were implemented using Waterfall, which shows a very small percentage of successful projects and a very large percentage of those that are having challenges and <clears throat> pretty good number of failures as well. So you can see the results on the Agile projects. It doesn't solve all of the problems. It's not a silver bullet, but it definitely improved the results. So. Um, much more successful projects using the Agile approach, fewer failures, and still a lot of challenges, but again, not as many. So, And finally, um, because I will talk about this a little bit tonight, um, the Scaled Agile Framework is something that I'll, um, one of the companies that I worked at, actually uh, Markel uses it as well, have adopted, which is one of several different um, approaches to scaling Agile beyond just uh, Scrum, which is you know, intended for individual development teams. So I just kind of wanted to show you, I mean, the, I remember the first time I saw this drawing and it's just completely overwhelming. And uh, I guess I, I, it's mind boggling almost. And of course I picked the full configuration of SAFE just to make it that much more confusing looking. But um, one thing that you might notice if you just focus on that very bottom uh, row there, or yeah, the row, it, it really is made up of scrum teams. So at the foundation, 
it's still, or you know, it might be Kanban or Scrum. Agile teams are still functioning at the lower level. It's just different layers of, um, some might call it overhead, some might call it, you know, um, governance, whatever. Just uh, a, a slightly different model that sort of brings those teams together so that they're operating instead of independent Agile teams, but a team of teams. So, and a company may have multiple Agile release trains, um, each one focused around a particular value stream or deliverable. So, just real quick high level on what scaled Agile is when you hear me refer to that. And I think we'll have a lot of time at the end for questions, so. Um, so, that's, that's a lot um, to kind of go over really, really short and um, really what I want to talk to you about again is, is the experiences that I've had at two very different companies and how difficult um, change can be, especially in a very large, complex organization. Some organizations, you know, it, it goes off very, very easily. Um, so what I'm, what I'm going to talk through today is sort of an approach that can help you think about um, how to do this systematically, thinking about different pillars for business agility, um, the, the culture of continuous improvement that needs to be there, uh, a team structure that brings together cross-functional resources, and um, again, it, it kind of points to how taking a structured approach can be helpful. So I know what you're thinking, structured agility, uh, kind of sounds a little bit like an oxymoron, um, seems like those things wouldn't go together. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll talk through this and I'll share through the experiences that I had at these two companies. So, um, about, whoa, whoa, there I go again, hear me, okay, this is just not my thing. Okay, about uh, probably 15, 16 years ago, I worked at a company like this, this isn't a picture of the actual company, um, and you know, it was a company that already had a, a foundation of teamwork. Uh, the culture was, was really great. It was extremely important there. Um, they hired for culture. They had open workspaces. I mean, everything was just sort of ripe for bringing in um, Agile. And when I started there, in fact, they were a traditional shop. But um, we did go, we did, you know, when Agile was still pretty early um, in its inception, actually, when we decided to bring it in, um, you know, we just, we ran a little pilot project. It was successful. Um, we gave a presentation to some executives. They said, yep, go for it. Hired a consulting company uh, to come in. We actually brought in Mike Cohn. If those of you who are in the Agile world probably know who Mike Cohn is. And uh, we trained everybody all at once. A bunch of us got our Scrum Master certification. And um, we reorganized into cross-functional teams. We actually didn't do that right away. We did that shortly after we adopted it. It just seemed like the, the next natural thing to do, and it was really helpful. So anyway, easy. I mean, it was just um, the easiest agile transformation I think you could ever experience was at this company. But again, there were certain things that were already in place that made it sort of the ideal situation. So then I went to work for a company like this. So it was a very, very different environment, a uh, very different culture. Um, not, <laughs> I'm, I'm, some of this is, is a little over the, the top and some of it's not, so just so you know. Um, it, they really did have the high cube walls. Um, I'm not sure if they still exist today, but it was, you know, you'd walk into the caves and somebody's, yeah, you know what I'm, where I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> um, Technology wasn't exactly um, cutting edge, uh, leading edge, bleeding edge. It wasn't, it was, yeah, nowhere close. So a lot of mainframe things going on. I mean, it was just a very complex environment and the, there was just nothing there that said, yes, let's, let's bring in Agile, it's gonna be a huge success. Um, they had actually brought in Agile practices. A couple of teams kind of decided that it would be a good idea um, about seven years prior to my joining that company and um, no, I don't think it was seven years. It was sometime shortly before I joined. Um, but it never really got beyond this grassroots effort. So, um, in fact, it almost died out. I mean, people were just so opposed. They, they um, at the time, told teams that they could decide, you know, use whatever approach you want. You can use uh, Waterfall, you can use Scrum. And a lot of people just didn't want to go through the change um, and all that. So we still had a lot of teams doing Waterfall. And um, it really wasn't then until, oh, I was going to say, it, it almost died out. You know, I 
wasn't going to let that happen. So um, I fought to kind of keep it going. Uh, we, we even went so far as to get a senior vice president in IT to sponsor um, the initiative to be more agile. And even at that, even with this concerted effort and a sponsor, we still only got to maybe 40% of the teams that were using agile approaches. So um, the other 60% were still uh, more waterfall. So even that did not work. But then uh, a few years back, that company got a new CEO. And he was a little bit more visionary. I uh, changed the dress code to jeans, um, broke down some of the walls, had more open spaces in the building. <laughs> I see the glances. Um, <laughs> some trendy, cool new furniture. And so things are really starting to change. But jeans and cool furniture are not enough to make that sort of you know, transformation successful. Um, but you know, he's a really smart guy, and he was a big reader. So he did a lot of research and studying and reading um, and learned about this concept of you know, what enterprise business agility really meant and what that was. So um, he had the foresight to um, start up an enterprise PMO. So he took one of the uh, senior vice presidents from a business area and had them um, form an enterprise PMO. And, and the reason, by the way, that, that company already had multiple other PMOs, but it, that was actually part of the problem. There were um, several PMOs that were sort of functioning independently, and there was never really um, a way to bring them all together and, and gain agreement on how to move forward. So each one really functioned however they wanted. So the enterprise PMO was sort of given this challenge to bring in, um, to, to help transform the whole organization and to be more agile. And really starting initially focusing on the software development teams. So um, I think initially they tried just to, to launch lots of scrum teams and eventually decided to bring in scaled agile. So that's why I wanted to introduce you to the chart. Um, for a company like that, that was so large and had a lot of tenure and hierarchy and other things to overcome, the Scaled Agile Framework actually was the secret sauce that helped the leadership from the top down buy into the idea of Agile. And I have to tell you, um, for years before that, I had been hearing one of my peers talking about safe, 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 and she'd bring up the charts and all that, and I just wasn't really into it. <laughs> I just couldn't, couldn't get on board with it at that time because I'd experienced the dream, you know? I saw how easy it could be. But I did come to realize that um, that just wasn't going to fly at a company like that. So they really needed something a little bit different so that everybody could feel comfortable. And really the decision that, that I came to was, um, I guess I don't care what approach we use. It could be safe, it could be less, it could be dead, it could be whatever, as long as we get to the result of um, high functioning agile teams so and enterprise agility. And that was just kind of what worked for them. And today, uh, the other thing that that company did was um, roll out uh, enterprise-wide culture uh, shaping workshops. And so they actually were putting every single employee, and we're talking, you know, 4,500, 5,000 people through a two-day workshop, everybody. So I had the opportunity to be one of the facilitators of those workshops, and it was really pretty amazing. So focusing on a lot of other cultural elements that needed to be there to support this kind of change. So we talked about accountability and you know just being present and um, a lot of really good concepts that kind of helped shift the culture at the same time that we were rolling out this enterprise business agility. So um, I'm going to share some of the um, key factors that really helped us in the uh, second implementation but really as I thought through this I thought um, this sort of a a framework or thinking about it in this way can work anywhere. Um, you know, you can customize it as needed, you know, for each individual situation or each company's scenario. But we really thought about different pillars of change that needed to occur in the company. Um, and this isn't exactly uh, what was used. There are some, some that are kind of the same, but ours was actually, I think we had more, pill seven pillars or something like that. Um, the other thing to note is uh, when you think about, and I'll talk this about this a little later, you know, how to um, pull that off. It wasn't like the, the EPMO or the leader of the EBA was responsible for leading all of the change efforts in all of these pillars. So it's really leveraging different partners across the company to help make that happen. But um, the ones that I decided to pull out that I felt were a good foundation to start from are the thinking about culture and leadership, 
uh, the Agile Mindset, Customer Seat at the Table, and Technology. So I'll go through each one of those. <clears throat> oh, the other thing is, so again, if, if I think about the first company, if we were to apply something like this, um, the culture and the leadership aspect of it was really pretty strong. The technology part of it was really pretty strong already. Um, I would still probably not remove them from some level of attention and focus because um, things can revert as you're going through a large change in a company. Uh, you can lose sight of some of those things. So I would say it's important to keep them you know, always at, on the forefront. Um, and the other thing is some companies will take one of these and maybe make it like the foundation of the whole change initiative. But again, um, let's say you decide technology is going to be the foundation. Not all um, agility efforts uh, require technology changes. So um, a lot of companies, if you're a technology company, maybe that makes sense. Um, so, but I would, you know, however you decide to organize it, if you were to take on something like this, I would at least have those represented. So let's talk about each one of them a little bit, if I can stay on a slide. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. All right, so culture. Um, one of the things that was really uh, important for the second company that I worked at was to um, really change how leaders had uh, defined their success. So um, previously, each of the leaders had you know, certain responsibilities that they were um, incented on, I guess. Um, their success depended on their ability to get certain initiatives done and things like that. So um, we, when we initiated the culture change, one of the things uh, that we did was really bring all the leaders together so um, that they were, every one of them had input into every initiative. So it was something that they really strongly had resisted. Um, but I feel like every leader should have a say. And sometimes, you know, they, they, we had to think through incentive programs. So in, a, in an initiative like this, it would be important to partner with your HR um, representatives to make sure that you're thinking through things like this, because if you're still incenting the old behavior, a change like that would not be successful. But um, sometimes somebody would come to the realization that I'm going to give up my initiative because now that I see the other initiatives that are better for the company that are maybe more important, you know, they're more willing to do that. So in the previous situation uh, that didn't occur, and it really kind of landed on the teams to try to figure out how to get all the work done with all these competing priorities. And so... Perfect. So let's see how agile everybody is here. We can adapt to this situation. What's that? All right. Disregard the alarm. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Yeah. All right. So um, the other. Do you know how many times he says it? Six, really? Okay. All right, we'll just go wait a couple more. I promise my presentation is shorter than an hour, so we got plenty of time. <laughs> Here we go. At least that's muted. I've heard it way louder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's funny. Just power through, just push through it. All right. I just. I like when I'm trying to listen to two things at once, it drives me crazy, so I don't want to drive you crazy. All right, focus back on me. <laughs> All right, so the other thing that we really had to contend with was um, leaders who had, um, had very much a command and control style. Um, there was a lot of tenure in that company, and a lot of folks were hired and sort of brought up that way that that was how you lead teams. And so trying to um, change some of those behaviors and encourage more of a servant leader approach was also a very big challenge. So just kind of wanted to acknowledge that um, there are major challenges when looking at culture and leadership. And uh, we had a separate team that, that was run out of our corporate operations area that helped with the culture change, that engaged people across the organization, lots of culture champions, lots of supporting material. but. Um, really trying to encourage more um, experimentation and that failure is okay because previously 
um, folks were really, really afraid to try something that they might fail and, and be reprimanded for that. So those kinds of things um, take a lot of time and are not easy to change when it comes to culture and leadership. So I pulled this picture in because I just felt like it, it was sort of representative of some, of some leaders that I've you know, encountered in my time. I don't know if you all have or not, I hope not, but I mean, how would you like to try to bring a new idea to this guy? <laughs> I mean, it kind of looks like um, he's judging you right out of the gate, right? So if you are hiring, you know, bringing in new employees constantly and you're trying to encourage uh, new ideas and innovation, this is kind of the result, right? They're, they're, they won't speak up, they're silenced. Um, and so you kind of lose out on the opportunity to bring new ideas in the organization when leadership looks like that, so, or acts like that. Uh, and really what you want to be able to do is unleash the superpower of your employees and get all their great ideas and innovation and excitement around the work out. So that's why the culture and leadership change is so important. All right. And uh, agile mindset, so that's one of the other uh, pillars. And really getting everybody to understand that agile is not something you do, but it's something you become is, is a difficult thing to overcome as well. It's really more of a mindset. And even if people kind of understand that concept, um, getting them to an agile mindset is, is a little bit of a challenge sometimes if that's not where they've historically been brought up in their career. So, um, you know, it really is a new way of thinking about things, looking at things through a new lens. Um, when faced with challenges, uh, and I, I still to this day, there's people that I work with that I get the no because, um, instead of the yes if. So what are the conditions that have to be true for you to be willing to try this, right? So, um, you know, oftentimes you kind of get the instant no because. So getting people to be more imaginative and think about what if we did this or what if we did that and how to be successful in that way. Um, and I think I have another slide. Oh, gosh, there we go. <laughs> I think I need to just try to click it and not roll it. So um, it's really very uh, extremely important and I can't really say enough about that because um, some of us, depending on how long you've been in the field, have been conditioned for a very long time that uh, failure is bad and that, that you'll be punished if you fail. So um, I kind of started looking into a lot of different ways to sort to overcome that. And at that larger second company, um, in, to the IT leadership team, I brought um, in you know an activity where we were just there to celebrate failures and to just take a bow, you know, say ta-da, this is the thing I failed at. And getting people to practice in a safe environment, so in a leadership meeting before they can go out and do it with their teams, um, and getting them to be more accepting of that sort of approach. Um, because employees need to see that leaders are vulnerable and they want to hear about the mistakes that they've made. Um, and then it helps employees open up and start to realize that it's really okay to try. As long as you learn, right? As long as you learn from your mistakes, then and that's okay. So. Um, Learning the art of storytelling uh, is something that's really helpful in that. And then um, also allowing, and this is something we still struggle with today too at my, my current, is allowing designs to sort of emerge instead of having everything known up front, um, still you know, being asked for forecasts and budgets and you know, having the sort of the final thing done up front is, is a different way of functioning with software development teams. Decentralizing some of that decision making is another part of it. Um, so again, getting business leaders to understand that when you allow the teams to solve problems, oftentimes you will come up with a better result than what um, they may have been thought up by uh, one or two people up front in the initial stages. So. Um, Let's see, I talked a little bit about rewards systems, but even with the employees, so kind of removing that, um, anything that incents a sense of competition amongst team members to excel or be the superhero on the team alone, right? To understand that um, a team rewarded for their success as a group is gonna be more um, successful and beneficial and work better together and produce a better product, so, all right. So that was Agile Mindset, a lot to think about there. Um, so customer seat at the table. This, this one um, is a really popular theme. I think a lot of companies are talking about it and doing it and trying to figure out how to bring in the voice of the customer. 
And for some companies that, that maybe have more direct interaction with their customers, it's a little bit easier than um, folks who work in an environment where they've never actually met a real customer. So you know, there's different things that you have to consider depending on how your company um, operates, what sort of model there is. Um, so, but really getting, however you do it, the voice of the customer in so that you're building really what they want and not what you think they want. Um, when I was <coughs> taking notes on this, it did remind me though that you know, Henry Ford, I think, was quoted as saying, if I asked customers what they wanted, they'd have said faster horses. So, and I think you know, that may be true if you're really trying to, to come up with something new and innovative. I think for most, um, uh, most of the scenarios I've been in anyway, that wasn't the, the case. We had sort of a predefined set of products and maybe we were enhancing them or moving to another system or thing like that. We weren't really um, in a situation where we've been asked to do some breakthrough innovation. So there's a place for, for both. You know, you want to be able to do really big creative innovation things and then you also want to be able to understand this product that we already have, what would make it better to you, customer? So um, some companies do focus groups and then you know, get the feedback that way. Um, we used input from our customer service representatives. What are the things you're hearing when you're on the phone with customers that we can improve on what's like the most common complaint or something like that? So there's, there are many different ways. Um, we also had a customer experience team and so there were different representatives. Sometimes those folks would be placed on an Agile team or with an Agile release train to help bring in that voice of the customer to uh, that group and make sure that we were always taking that into account. Nope, clicking didn't, didn't make it better. Maybe that one, I don't know. Mouse challenge, that's crazy. All right, no, that's, help me. <laughs> huh? Uh, nope. There we go. There we go. All right. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so funny. All right. So um, again, I, I talked about it a little bit. If you don't have uh, direct contact with the customer, there's many different ways to sort of bring that feedback in. Um, and again, ideally your teams would have a product owner uh, working with the software development teams to sort of represent uh, that feedback as well. And maybe a project management group who's um, helping with the, not just uh, their vision for the product, but bringing cu customer feedback. So either way, um, it just should be part of the way you're doing business uh, when you're thinking about enterprise agility. So responding to customer input. There we go. All right, so technology pillar. Um, so again, from the, the first company that I uh, went through the transformation with from the second, the first one just really had the ideal technology situation. Everything was always up to date. It was very much a leading edge shop. Um, everything was very standard. And so there were really no, no problems. The second company, there were so many technology challenges that can actually um, greatly impede your success in trying to be an agile organization. So you can't respond quickly if it takes, you know, months and months to make a change in the system or you have to wait for some batch process that runs or, you know, whatever the situation is. Uh, the technology issues um, in the organization have to be addressed to help make this successful. Um, you know, it, it could be a situation where it's just minor updates that you have to do on an ongoing basis or it might be an entirely you know, radical technology transformation that needs to happen in concert with the agility changes. Um, yeah, I mean, because if you think about the, the advances in technology and how that's changed our world, I mean, I pulled out a couple pictures of just some of the things that our customers are, you know, being exposed to. And um, I know I get impatient because, you know, I've got my phone and I can check my email at any moment. I have information instantly, you know, accessible. So that starts to bleed into, you know, our work environment. So people kind of expect instant information. So that is very important. Um, and a lot of companies are, you know, just starting to get into things. I, I guess, you know, some of this stuff's been around a little while, but mobile apps and, you know, cloud solutions and um, things like that just to be competitive or more efficient. Um, for a newer company, those, some of those things are a little bit easier to do. For a company that's dealing with really old, outdated technology, those things can be a little bit more challenging. 
Um, but again, you have to address the gaps in your technology um, because of the rate of change. This work is never done. So this isn't something you, you put a checklist and then, okay, we update all our technology that you know, we can move on. It needs constant attention. So I think all of you know that. So, okay. Other considerations. So those were just the, the four pillars um, real briefly. There are other things that you need to think about. Oh, a colorful s superhero, free photo. That's nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now you know my secret. <laughs> um, you also need to think about um, who needs to be involved in each one of those pillars of change. And again, you may have additional pillars or something a little bit different. but. Really considering who needs to be involved because I don't know, well, in the, in the second situation, there's no way that one team, that enterprise PMO, could have tackled all of those things on their own. So really engaging other partners was super important. Who will lead each one of those initiatives is also extremely important. So it has to be um, people with enough influence across the company, so respected and ability, you know, able to influence their peers is really important uh, in leading. And how do you keep it alive? What is your approach to continuous improvement and not letting it sort of be the flavor of the day sort of thing? How does it impact the organizational structure is a, is a big factor. So I mentioned actually in both situations, um, co the companies went through an entire organizational restructure to get to the cross-functional teams. So, but there could be other organizational structures that are impacted uh, to business partners or other things like that. So who will be involved? Um, you're probably, some of you might be familiar with Peter Senge's uh, work around systems thinking, and he talks about how, you know, as humans, we're all part of a family, and sometimes family members do or say things that um, unintended or intended have consequences that impact us and how we act and how we feel and et cetera. Companies are a lot the, the same. So really taking a systems approach and understanding that there is a huge web of interdependence across all the departments when you're doing something like this is important. So taking a holistic approach and understanding that an organization is just a big ecosystem um, is important when you're thinking about who to be involved. So again, consider all your different departments and um, audit, you know, does audit need to be involved? If you're changing your approaches to delivering software, there are oftentimes audit requirements. And so how do you engage with your audit team? Um, I actually went through some, I um, put our audit team through safe training, or not safe training, just agile training, and helped them work in a more agile fashion and help them engage with the agile release train so that they were part of the solution and, you know what I mean, up front. So instead of coming back after the fact with their clipboard and their red pens and saying, these are all the things you did wrong, they could tell us up front so that we could build it in as we went. So engaging more as a partner. So audit, I mean, who'd have, who'd have thought about that? By the way, not everybody was really happy that we got audit operating more <laughs> efficiently and could do more audits, yay. <laughs> but, you know, it, it can take a lot of different people to, to pull this off. Um, who will lead? So again, I talked about in um, the enterprise PMO, you know, the CEO sort of uh, handpicked a senior executive to sort of lead the business agility um, effort. But again, there were other folks who were leading other parts of it, corporate operations. And uh, we actually had a lean um, operational excellence team that helped lead some of the continuous improvement activities. So, but really um, focusing on the folks who have that influence and respect that I, that I mentioned earlier. So, and is that my next one? It is. So, um, I, you know, I mentioned that they had uh, adopted the scaled agile framework at the second company. Um, so standing up, um, Agile teams is really, I feel like this slide is out of order, but it's not, okay. Um, moving to the scaled Agile framework was uh, really a big task. And so we ran into a lot of problems trying to get items prioritized, as I mentioned. So um, it really, the, the approach that they took there was um, the EPMO themselves went through all the training and then uh, we formed, we, we called ourselves an agile release train. We had a couple different teams. You know, we didn't, weren't doing software development, in fact, at that time um, as part of the EPMO. Um, but we tried to practice the ceremonies and things like that so that we were knowledgeable as we were rolling this out to other teams. And so we hired additional coaches and brought in you know, certified trainers and things like that. But um, really trying to practice what we were you know, going to preach to other teams was important for the uh, 
the EPMO, which happened to be the ones leading the Enterprise Business Agility Initiative. So I guess that was sort of my point, um, that even though we didn't fit the typical criteria, we did practice that so that we could um, roll that out. So let's talk about continuous improvement for a minute too. How many of you remember when Mario looked like this? <laughs> Come on, I know it's aging some of us. So um, what if Nintendo decided that was good enough and never made any changes? <laughs> Luckily for gamers everywhere, they, they, they gave him an uh, no. Sorry, now it's not even, there we go. Yeah, that's not really much better. There, now we have this today. So um, again, thinking about uh, continuous improvement and how important that can be. Um, you never stop improving and updating because it, it, again, it's kind of like the technology upgrades. It's, it's a job that's never done. So there's always something that you can do better, um, experimenting. Again, things change constantly. So um, continuous improvement is an extremely um, important thing to consider as you're rolling out these changes as well or in enterprise business agility. So one of the things that we did, and again I'll touch on this in a couple slides, but you know as we were thinking through all, the, all of the pillars, we sort of thought about it in terms of um, levels of maturity. And I'm not a big you know maturity model person necessarily, but we knew that we weren't going to go you know all in and try to get it perfect. We knew we weren't going to get it perfect the first time. And so it's like, okay, what are the things that we want to accomplish in the initial, initial stages of these changes? And so we kind of set some goals for each of those pillars and, and made some changes. And once we started to see that um, become successful, we set higher goals, like uh, how, how can we make it even better in we, each one of those? We actually had, you know, I think three or four different levels of um, you know, we're kind of stepping into this, we're, you know, in this crawl stage, and then we want to improve it and get better, and, and what would a mature, you know, enterprise or business, or agile organization uh, look like. So that's a little bit about continuous improvement, and um, I think I've talked through most of the stuff already on this. Again, we had lean operational excellence initiatives that had been running long term, I'm sure most of you have been through. Um, perhaps several iterations of that with many different names, right? So uh, we leveraged those resources to help us with some of this continuous improvement activity. So with some of the training and, and opportunities to go in and work with teams to help them uh, figure out how to innovate and keep looking at things differently. So organizational structure, um, I talked about this a little bit in this diagram. If you look at the picture on, the, on your left, um, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, typical team structure, you know, uh, back in the day, and I think some companies still have this, where maybe you have all of your business analysts on one team and all your developers on another team and all your QA on another team, with, each with their own manager. And as you're forming a project team or a scrum team, you need, you know, one or two or three members from each of those. But what that does is it starts to involve lots of different managers or layers of management. So organizing teams in a, in a more cross-functional manager where you have one lead or one manager with the cross-functional team of resources helps reduce a little bit of that overhead and confusion that that can create when you've got multiple people perhaps giving their team members different directions. So um, the organizational structure, at least in terms of the software development teams, was something to think about. And both companies with their very different approaches did a very similar or the same organizational restructure. So, oh yeah, I had to do this because it made me think about my silverware drawer. I'm like, <laughs> so I go to set the table and you're like, well, here's the forks and I need a spoon and they need a knife and like, right, for each person. And I thought, why don't I just do this with my silverware drawer and put each, no, that's taking it too far. <laughs> <laughs> Am I taking it too far, right? Group them together and you just grab a put table setting. All right, a little humor. <sighs> Scroll, here we go. Okay, so this is just kind of wrapping it all up. Um, you know, I talked about the, the four different pillars. Um, again, you might have five, six, seven, or eight, whatever your number is. Um, and just kind of a way to think about it. So you've got, you're thinking about culture and leadership, you're starting to define what does that look like and what does it feel like um, as it starts to evolve? What are the behaviors that you would like to see that are maybe different from what you're seeing today? Or, or the same, just what does it look like um, as you, think about your, your enterprise becoming more agile. Um, what outcomes do you want through 
um, any sort of uh, cultural leadership change that you might be implementing. Um, what actions will you take to help ensure that that's happening? Who needs to be involved? Um, who's going to lead it? Just a way to court sort of structure um, how you think through how you're going to take on something like this. Agile mindset, same thing, customer seat at the table and technology. And like I said, you could have different levels of maturity. I mean, it's okay. I'm a, I used to be the biggest agile snob on the planet when I worked at the first company and it was so easy and we brought in my cone and we were just so perfect. And, um, you know, it's really easy to, to sort of take that for granted, I guess, that it's not that easy at other companies. And I did really learn when I went to the second company that um, there are, it, it's okay to try. And I really wanted to acknowledge and reward people for the things that they were doing to try to become more agile instead of punishing them for not being by somebody's book, you know, implementing all the techniques exactly the way so and so wrote it in their book. Um, you know, it, it all goes back to the manifesto and the principles. And um, I heard Alistair Coburn one time say that all of that other stuff is uh, barnacles that have attached themselves to agile. And that's really not what it's about. So um, taking that sort of continuous improvement approach and thinking about, you know, just out of the gate, what, what do we want this to look like? And then continually iterating through that in a very agile manner. So there you go. That's it. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely challenging, um, but I'll say it is extremely rewarding. And I know the other folks in the room that have been through these would probably agree. So um, I just encourage you to, uh, on your journey, give it a try. And with that, I'll open it up. What questions do you have? Um, I got a few minutes, right? We got a little time. Anybody have any questions? Discussion? Want to share a story? Tell a joke? Yes, Mandy. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Really <laughs> you talked a lot about the challenges, especially with the second company. Yeah. I was wondering if you could share some, maybe some of your favorite memories of a big win or where you saw somebody have an aha. Something yeah. Like that. Hmm. Yeah. That's a really great question. I have to think about that a minute. Because um, there really were a lot. Um, OK, I've got one. So I had a coworker, I'll just say. I don't want to get too specific, because you know, people know things, and other people. <laughs> um, who was, <laughs> Um, I, I mean, we, we kind of worked side by side for a very long time, and I was always the agile person, and she was always the never, ever, ever, never will I. Um, that waterfall works just fine, and that's the only thing that will work in my situation, and so, you know, you do your thing. You be you, I'll be me. And um, I, I remember when the light bulb came on, and, and suddenly she became like the biggest advocate of agile. It was, it was just super amazing. So. I think, again, that there's a lot of myths, right? There's a lot of preconceived notions. It only works in startups. It only works on new development. It never works in this situation, or it's not meant for that. Um, and kind of seeing people prove it out, and like, yes, it can work, and it can make the product even better. Um, and just watching them come to that realization, that was super rewarding. So yeah. What else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and technology and you start with a pilot team yeah. um, and you continue to scale. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times it's driven from technology. Yes. But then there's an intersection yep. where it needs to align yep. uh, with how business and all the other departments or business units are yeah. operating and thinking. Correct. So at the end of the day, you have this high level strategy. Yeah high level approach and you've got to break it down to get to the delivery team. So yeah. I think a lot of times there is um, not as much emphasis placed around putting together a plan to actually achieve that. Right. Not necessarily mm -hmm. a plan, but defining it and articulating it so people understand what they're building. Right, right. Do you have any experience? Yeah, and I would invite, I, mean, I know there's a lot of other experienced Agile folks in the room, so anybody else who wants to um, provide some thoughts on that. Um, I would just say, um, A, there is a little bit of a misconception. That's, I, I consider that one of the myths about Agile, that there's um, 
not planning, there's actually more planning, or there's not documentation. I always tell people, I remember somebody coming to me saying, we can't do Agile on this project because we need documentation. <laughs> and I said, Agile doesn't say there's no documentation, it says just enough. And, and who defines what's enough? I mean, I think we do. Let's have a conversation about what you need and why you need it, and that's what is just enough in this situation. Um, but in terms of, you know, that, that is, um, I guess the challenge that a lot of scrum teams face is that you're trying to execute in this agile fashion with all of the processes um, that feed into that being still traditional. Um, and, and I face that today in Markel. We have um, our version of an enterprise PMO there that's still very traditional. And you know, we started to talk through things like audits and governance and things and what can we, what can we do what can we do to satisfy your requirements so that you get what you want and it doesn't radically change what we want. I've been asked to put together you know, a full-blown roadmap for a project that would take, you know, it was a multi-year thing, and even though we plan to execute it in an agile fashion once we, you know, once we got it approved and started, there still has to be that approval process. And until you reach true enterprise business agility, you always have to make those compromises. So, um, We'll, you know, we still have to meet the needs of the business, and then once it gets to execution, until we get to a point where we're starting to influence these other, our business partners, to think about things a little bit differently too, which again were some of the points I was talking about. That's huge and it's very difficult, and again, at the second company, the CEO drove that, so that's why we were able to do it at an enterprise level. So yeah, it, it's a great point, and I don't know, again, if anybody else wants to add anything. Sorry, I don't mean to keep looking at you. No, Michelle, do you have any thoughts? No. <laughs> I, I can. Yeah. I echo exactly what you said. So uh -huh. even in um, the organization I'm currently helping is that um, technical designs, right? We, we can whiteboard it, take a picture. As long as it's legible, <laughs> uh -huh. then we, um, that's our documentation. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I strongly believe in taking a lean approach. Yeah. You know, what's just enough mm -hmm. that satisfies your audit if there is a hard audit requirement. So um, so I help um, I'm helping a higher ed mm -hmm. and trust me. <laughs> um, regulation audit is very important so we do. We, we still write minutes and that kind of thing, but just enough information. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be all in yeah. an essay format but just bullet items and action items and so forth. So mm -hmm. there's many ways you can really still have documentation to satisfy the whatever the other one is. So. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I think at the end of the day, until the enterprise recognizes we're all playing one game, mm -hmm. and then we each have a different position, but at the end of the day, we're all after the same goal, that's where it becomes extremely challenging to execute with full business agility. Yeah. Um, if we all still have different um, mm -hmm. goals and objectives, back to the incentives, yep. um, until you align as a team, it's really hard to pull off full enterprise agility. Yeah. I just didn't know if, if there were some other examples of either um, seeing that in practice. So mm -hmm. um, coming from a, a different background where let's say there's more uh, more of like a matrix organization. Yes. So yep. to your point where you can find groups mm -hmm. or communities of practice yep. um, where you can find a home or feel like you're part of the team, but yeah. then you're delivering something mm -hmm. for not just a full technology stack. Right. Of like a technical team, mm -hmm. but an actual full stack business yeah. team. Yeah. So I didn't know if there were any Yeah, again, I, I, yeah, and I would say in the second organization, you know, we did experience a lot of that. Um, it was, again, especially when we tried to do grassroots, you know, there were always lots of compromises and things that we did um, to satisfy the needs of the business and our internal um, customers and still be able to execute Agile. It wasn't ideal, but it was what we could do at the time. It was what we had to work with. Um, but then as we started to roll out more of the enterprise business agility, um, you know, things started to change, but it, it still <coughs> takes a lot of time. And we still, you know, I mean, at the time that I left that organization, it was, wasn't done. I mean, I guess it's never done, but there were still a lot of areas that were operating in the old way. And, and I mean, you just can't say, I, I I don't do that anymore. I'm not going to take a look at the big picture of the, the full, you know, beyond the software implementation. Um, it was interesting in, in part of the restructure at the second organization. I mean, it wasn't just an IT restructure to cross-functional teams. 
they completely reorganized their, their business areas to focus on the end-to-end -end value stream uh, for the customer. So they got there, but before that, it was a lot of give and take, and how can we satisfy, yeah, yeah.